is publisher of Children Churches and Daddies and Down in the Dirt. All right. She has published many of us in this room right now. Her most recent book is Shattering the Glass Ceiling, released this month, centered around women's issues. Please welcome the former host at Gallery Cabaret before moving to Austin, ventured far beyond their city limits to join us here, Janet Kuypers. Resuming the Wednesday nights here yes. at the Gallery Cabaret. Thank you, that is awesome. I'd like to be able to have this back. I think this is the first time poetry is back here at this place, which has had foundations in poetry for decades. So thank you for continuing that. Yes. And hopefully when this is all over, we can take a group photo before yes. the second round, because I would double plus love it, because I'm in such a 1984 mode. <laughs> like we're all in one of the elements. Anyway. Well, uh, I believe that Jerry had chat books of what I'm going to read for you guys. Uh, right, they're at the bar. Okay. They're on the bar. So if anybody wants to know what on earth I'm going to goddamn read, you can grab a copy. Yeah. And the table of contents has a picture with the Chicago flag and the Illinois flag in it. It's really cool. Sorry, I'm just I'm a designer, so look at it. <laughs> Music you're going to hear in the background. Is music from the Hound Man of South Africa, Francois Le Brou. Um, yeah. Because his, his visa has been banned for five years because he was doing music here. And it was like, what? Money. So are you doing it for money? Oh, yeah. you're banned. So he couldn't get a visa. So he is living with his wife and child and they're trying to get their life together. But with that music, you also have some whisking the percussion that John added to this, so I hope you enjoy that. And uh, I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. are transmitted anyway. <laughs> Seminal fluids, blood transfusions, or not washing your hands. Did you think that you were safe vacationing on a cruise ship? <laughs> Silly you. For you forgot that we're now in this global economy, and what happens in Wuhan doesn't necessarily stay in Wuhan. <laughs> After thousands recently died from a recently discovered virus, it's discovered this virus escaped from a bio-research lab in China. Not Russia, not the Middle East, but a place where they now say that the Great Wall is only for show. But is it really? For the only known bio-lab in China, in Wuhan, recently reissued a statement on cleanliness for the country to avoid disease, released just after this most recent mass epidemic was fully discovered. <clears throat> and you'd think a lab would know how to be clean, but that doesn't mean that their well-paid researchers wouldn't illegally make an extra buck, or would that be making many, many extra yuan? Uh, that doesn't mean these researchers wouldn't sell these laboratory animals still alive for extra cash. Because one Beijing researcher said they once sold live monkeys and rats for the equivalent of over a million U.S. dollars. And yes, those precious disease-ridden animals made their way into people's stomachs and maybe eventually to people working on your cruise ships. And you thought you were safe. Silly you. You should know better. You thought that if you didn't swallow three gallons of someone's saliva, you'd remain safe from contracting these infectious diseases. You've been vaccinated. You even go so far as to wash your hands. How noble of you. And you 
thought that that was enough. But as I said, this global economy means it's almost like we're all sharing one giant bed together. We just didn't realize how messy that bed could really be. How messy indeed. <laughs> Thank you. On pandemic haikus. You hear things every once in a while and you're like, that's a thing. Found pandemic haiku, proliferations of babies and divorces follow pandemics. I discussed this with Lynn this evening. This is a poem called Everyone's Afraid. My immune system has been wreaking havoc on me. I can't say my father never gave me anything. For with his genes, my cells stopped fighting against viruses that wanted to swell my random joints into balloons. Exhausting every homeopathic option I could muster, I finally relented, perusing the pharmaceutical library, took one drug after another, till they dropped me into a study for a regular injectable drug that they say is set to save me. I don't eat meat. I care for all of the world. And my thanks is a virus trying to make me explode from the inside out. So, me and my suppressed immune system saw no difference in a new pandemic. Now everyone's afraid. Like I always am. A year passes, and like a good little soldier, I don't question what's in an untested vaccine, and I don't react to shots. But with this second shot, I was reminded of what this virus can really do with every joint aching as I fever the pain away. So, as I lay here, sick, only wanting to be better, I learned that there are more microbes in my body than human cells. We try to fight these miniature invisible monsters, but if less than half of me is even human, then what on earth am I? That's enough talking about pandemics and COVID and viri. And viri for you guys. Um, a gentleman in the UK did a thing where somebody started with a poem and then they asked some other poet, here's the last line of a poem, continue and write something based on it. Had a hundred, maybe a hundred and two people. I got to be poet 101, <laughs> one line, and I came up with this and I love this piece. It's called Out to the Horizon. Driftwood disintegrated out with the tide, like flotsam wreckage from what we survived. Jetsam drifts to shore while we still also fall in love with the sea, and our essence drifts out toward the horizon until I find myself lost, wondering where on earth that damn land is. I, I know, I know, we are 70% water. I can feel like a fish, a dolphin, or even a bird, like an arctic penguin, porpoising our way through the deepest depths, for water is our essence. Too many times the ocean called out to me, and I dove in, head first, swimming out too far, until violent waves came, crashing into me, capsizing me deep into the sea, forcing down my throat an ocean of traumas, past, present, future, until I suddenly wonder if it matters, if it rains, treading water. A, a cyclone, hurricane, typhoon swells inside me, until water overwhelms me. I start randomly swimming, look for land, and pick a direction, try to find that edge. They all say that land is vast, but this water seems endless. So I start to panic, and that is when I realize that the edge is right there. Is it dirt? Is it sand? And when I finally get there, I see the wrinkles in your cupped hands, holding that water, holding that world. And now it all suddenly comes flooding back. You saved me again like I saved you before. Our souls intertwined. We've lived for eons, nourishing each other, from climbing the Alps 
to following Darwin, our bike to Mach Fry, wrought iron gates rattle in our hands. We shiver together in midnight South Pole winds, make music before the 1 a.m. Arctic Aurora Borealis. So what if armed guards watched us? Don't cry for me. Throughout the hemispheres, throughout history, we've stepped over those golden bars to emperor rooms. For, as I said, we've lived for eons, nourishing each other. And now it is your turn to hold that water. Let me swim to your hands until I climb out, jump onto your earth, stand. Then you can turn your hands, spill that water, and finally embrace me. This is a fun one, sorry. Um, this one I wrote after I saw a, poem, a movie about a poet. So, it's called Jar for My Beating Heart. If I ever lost you, if you ever left me, I, I think, well, I think I'd tear my heart out. I, I think I'd tear my heart out and I'd put it in a glass jar and leave it on a shelf. Wait, no, it'd be ceramic. If I put my heart away like luggage, that jar would have to be ceramic. I wouldn't want to see that heart, so ceramic it is. Because my once beating heart is only baggage on a shelf. But really, I, I think I tear out my heart and put it away because I see people every day and they all live like they have no heart. And after you're gone, I wouldn't hear my own heart beating anymore. So, after you're gone, what would I need my heart for anyway? Um, some of you remember from the last time I was here that I had written poems for every, for different elements, and I had, the first time I came around, I had volume one. I'm going to share with you a couple poems from volume two of Every Event of the Year, volume two, January to December. And the ones I'm sharing with you are ones I've never read with anyone else, and they all relate to where we live. These are all specifically chosen for you guys. This first one was written on the 8th of, of October for the start of the 1871 Great Chicago Fire, which lasted for two days. And for those of you who have the chat book, have, have you been distributed? Do you have them? This is important if you have them. If you have the chat book, you will see a picture of the destruction of the Notre Dame, which is the beginning of this poem. This is called Because of Fire. When we see fire overtake an 850-year-old monument to religion, beauty, history, we are taken aback, helpless, suddenly aghast, at a loss against that primal, silent killer. But we look at candles lit, hear the crackling campfire, we feel the fireplace warmth, and remember why a part of us still loves fire so. At times like this, we must remember that although a mass fire seems only a symbol for death and destruction, maybe after that great fire that took over the only city I love, maybe that destruction only leads to building something bigger, something better, something that made more sense. Because when I stroll from one neighborhood to the next with diverse cultural backgrounds, until I get toward the lake, where I can turn back and span the most beautiful skyline I've ever seen, I have to realize that this history of destruction allowed us to make something so good, all because of fire. For 
before that one, I had to do one song that I really like. And it's great that I'm doing it right here by the Blue Line. This was written on the 30th of November. For the 1866 date, that work began on the first U.S. underwater highway tunnel. And that was in Chicago. It's called Underground History. When I first took the L train into Chicago, the, I would commute every morning. I would take the red line along Lake Michigan for work. But in most of my years, in the only place I would call my home, I was taking the train from O'Hare Airport, taking the blue line. And all these years that I took that train, I always wondered why a small part of that train ride took me underground. But I didn't ask questions. I just took the train and never thought anything of it. I never thought of all that concrete lining our way underground. Johannes immigrated here, and later my father took over my grandfather's concrete construction company. When my father flew us to Las Vegas once, we, we flew over the Hoover Dam. His only words were, look at all that concrete. <laughs> but over 150 years ago, Chicago started work on their first underwater tunnel under the Chicago River, a tunnel with one lane for pedestrians and two lanes for horse-drawn carriages. Anyone who knows Chicago now may think this sounds ludicrous, but after the Chicago fire, people looked for something more stable as a form of travel, and underground, away from fire, seemed the way to go. They reversed the Chicago River a decade later, which lowered the water level, exposing the roof of the tunnel, and ships were underground. ground. So the federal government had to close it down as a safety hazard six years later. So to reconstruct, they changed it, added concrete, and after streetcars ran, it was converted to the subway, the underground parts of the L train, us Chicago commuters know. <laughs> a lot of construction and reconstruction existed in the Chicago rail plans, and a lot of plans were canceled. But it's cool to see that this concrete that runs through my family's veins was part of the making of these underground tunnels that Chicago is used today. Some people may say that only rural folk are grounded to the dirt of the earth and they feel real roots to the land that we live on. But I beg to differ because some city folk like me can actually feel grounded with the concrete we pour that pulls us in and literally bonds us to this land, both above ground and even below, where we least expect it to make our lives more complete. Whoa. <laughs> this one doesn't relate to anything. It's not, it's not related to a book. I'm just gonna share it with you. Hope you like it. It's called Quieting anechoic chamber. Once on the job, I had to go into an anechoic chamber. I lose this spot. What? Sorry, I'm going to fix this spot. It scanned me at the beginning. Sorry, you're going to have a moment of silence. I, this is what I get for using technology. <laughs> Gives me a better chance to be able to do this properly. Quieting in a chocolate chamber. Must tell folks. Once on the job, I had to go into an anechoic chamber to remove a piece of machinery. You see, this room had machinery <coughs> that would test if something could and would survive in space. And they would make this entire room shake violently to see if everything inside stayed together. When that room shakes so violently that there's a ton of noise. So they created this anechoic chamber there. This room had all these devices and slits and shock absorbers inside it so that all the pain just disappeared. This room had all these devices and slits, and this room had no sound, I mean, no sound at all. And I had to go in and remove a piece of equipment there. That work should take about 10 minutes. I didn't know what losing one sense instantly would do. Would you feel lost or panicked? 
with quieted footfalls, I worked in complete silence until I heard my blood coursing through my veins. After just a few minutes, without sound, I mean, almost no sound at all, I had to get out. Having no sound. The next two poems that I'm going to share with you are the first two poems in the Cyberwit Press book of Janet Kuiper's Women's Issues poems, a book of poetry and translations, and a bunch more that's titled Shattering the Glass Ceiling, which is why, of course, I had to wear my woman's symbol to match my cover. Mm -hmm. Shattering the Glass Ceiling. Uh, it was published this month during Women's History Month, and these are the first two poems in the book. This first one is titled, No One Reports for Women. I would like to start this like a news reporter, saying, Dateline, your town here, but news about women's issues is non-existent, which makes women wonder if concerns for women are non-existent too. Recently, I heard reports from multiple women who had been on birth control for 99% of their fertile lives. They contracted the most recent variant of COVID-19. And yes, they got vaccines and booster shots making COVID-19 like getting a minor cold. But these women noticed a week after recovery, about two weeks before their period should arrive, they started spotting, which didn't stop. So after 10 days, they asked around and found that other women were having this trouble with the reproductive health too, and no one had researched how to solve it. But really, think about it. Who would have the time to research something that the, when they had to work like mad, just come up with a vaccine on such short notice? And no one questions men's fertility after COVID-19 and enough immunization to protect you from this. But, Maybe the question should be this. After women can now control their reproductive rights, does that mean that after following the government's edicts to protect themselves and inject themselves, they'll still get sick, but, added bonus, they'll bleed daily for it? <laughs> because this is exactly the type of problem women don't want to talk about in public. And trust me, this shouldn't be a problem for any woman to ever have to deal with. After a woman sit alone in their corners with no support for their very personal problems, they don't know that other women are going through this too. And this little level of sympathy may assuage their feelings, but it may amount to only a fleeting gesture to know that they're not alone. For the more you realize how common this may be, the more any rational woman may wonder why something isn't being done to solve what is becoming a real bloody problem. <laughs> When many women's solution is to search the internet, they may start to panic when they read reports that birth control may increase blood clots, and COVID-19 may exacerbate that risk further, but, surprise, surprise, more research needs to be done to solve anything for women, and it still doesn't solve the daily bleeding that men are stating is harmless. Fine, but men aren't the ones bleeding every day. So this is beginning to sound more like more of the same, women think. We are in pain and nothing is being done. There may be theories that estrogen and progesterone may play a role in the novel coronavirus. May that explain the COVID-19 reaction differences between feminine me and my masculine husband? But taking estrogen daily, could that affect the vaccine or the virus? Well, it doesn't matter if one doctor after another hears a stack of anecdotal evidence from their patients because stories aren't proof and women are still stuck, bleeding, with no way to solve their medical problems. And for men out there who don't want to think about women bleeding, even though they have no problem with the same women bearing and raising their children, which women have to bleed monthly to make happen, and similar stories arise with young women possibly wanting to have children one day, 
missing their period for four months after getting COVID-19 with irregular periods resuming. Although one woman talked to her doctor about it, they assumed it was from COVID-19. But to quote the patient, none seemed too concerned about it. So welcome to another case of an unexpected medical problem for women that no one can explain. <laughs> you know, I, I jokingly said that I like to start this story by saying, Dateline, your town here. But maybe I should have said all along, <coughs> Dateline, your neighborhood, or Dateline, your street, or, or Dateline, your home. Because after now only hearing the now upswelling cries of women who have followed the rules and do what's best for them, women only suffer for it with no explanation and, of course, can't share their problems in an effort to solve them. <laughs> if women could tell their stories, it may only be a stepping stone. But if women did tell their stories, you may only then realize how serious the problems women go through can really be. Thank you. I have to do an aside, because I'm like, some people will freak by that. I did that in a feature a week ago in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And after I did it, a woman came up to me and said, thank you so much for reading that. I'm 70 years old and I had COVID and my period started again. Holy moly. <laughs> so it's like, holy moly. Oh, I'm like, what? She's like, we don't hear these things. There are these problems that are in, and nobody has an answer or a clue as to what to do about it. And that was why I wanted to share that with you guys. But the next one I'm going to share with you is the second poem in the book. And it is cool because it's about a story in Texas, but it's a nice angry piece. And it is called Like Nothing Ever Happened. In Waco, Texas, a grand jury found enough evidence in the case against a man and indicted on four counts of sexual assault to send the case to trial. Now, usually, when a grand jury sends a case to trial, that usually means there's enough evidence to convict. But I just heard on the news that instead, he pled no contest to one charge of unlawful restraint in return for the dismissal of four charges of sexual assault. With this plea deal from this fraternity president rapist who had nothing to offer the state in a plea deal, he gets this lower charge in exchange for counseling, a $400 fine, which is less than the fine for leaving a disabled car to get help, plus three years probation. Added bonus, if he stays clean until probation's over, his record would be expunged. Uh, this means he wouldn't have to register as a sex offender. It would be like, nothing ever happened. And this woman was repeatedly raped, strangled, and left for dead, face down in the dirt. She was brought to the hospital where they called the police. There's an enormous amount of evidence. A conviction is almost sure. Four counts of sexual assault and they treat it like nothing ever happened. Women think we've shattered the glass ceiling, but we still have to shatter the mentality that women are objects and rape is not a crime. We try to plead our case, but nothing ever happens. Maybe we women have to shatter more than ceilings, but also men's mentality. Maybe we should even shatter a few of your bones the way you shatter our souls with every act of rape. Shattering your bones wouldn't even cross the line you rape us cross with your misogyny and violence. Is that what we're left with? Is that what we have to do? Should we start to get down as low as you to try to start to even the score? If we're so equal, is it not our turn to exact our revenge? Just a few love for you guys. This one is titled, United We Wonder. Spending all day talking about how people should be united, I walked to an American Indian tent and I waited because these storytellers were ready to talk to us. And I realized then and there that we all have stories about what has been taken away from us, 
and how we can keep what is within us to share with all the world so that we can all grow. There's going to be event poems that relate to us here. This one is titled New the Word. It was written on the 2nd of December for the 1818 date that Illinois became the 21st state of the United States. New the Word. Did a man from my very distant familial past know what he found discovering this rich land with so much to offer? Did he know what he took from the people who knew this land all too well? Whether he knew or not, we remember those once holders of this sacred land. The Algonquin-speaking tribe natives called to this land knew the word Illinois really meant tribe of superior men. I cannot speak for what any ancestors did to you. But just know that I, personally, hear your words, know your meaning, and will honor this land as if it has always been my own. For to me, Illinois is only my own, which I honor the way you did, as I now honor you. I want to thank each and every one of you so very much. You guys are triple plus awesome. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This last poem is titled 18 and 8 plus 18 because it was written 18 years, 8 months, and 18 days after my wedding day, actually, uh, where we've been and what we've seen. I have journeyed around the world with you. After all I've seen, I'm now an observer an astronomer looking out into the universe, out past the solar system, past the Kuiper belt, trying to understand what makes everything, everything. I fly in airplanes, I jump from airplanes, I pilot airplanes getting closer to the stars. Molecule by molecule, we originate from stars and we are all linked, our bodies formed from stardust. But outer space is a violent place. Violent explosions create the stars, and our Earth has earthquakes, avalanches, typhoons, and volcanoes, and El Niños, tornadoes, tsunamis, and all of this madness. Somehow, I found you. With you, I have watched solar storms in the Arctic Circle's aurora borealis. We've even seen a dance over Greenland from our window, 40,000 feet in the sky. I have seen galaxies collide. I've seen comets smash into planets. I've seen supernova and the death of stars. And in all of that, I still found you. As I said before, I'm only an observer, but I found what I've been looking for. And with these observations, I, the, wed. And I'll tighten my grip on your hand when we travel into the night together.